Amen. It's so funny. John asked me a couple of days ago if I wanted particular songs. I told him no. I didn't have anything really on my heart specific. I kid you not, we just sang five songs. The second song about the, the train of the Lord's robe filling the temple, is, you can, it can be read in Revelation. It can also be read in Isaiah 6. And Isaiah says, Woe is me, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And the Lord comes down, or the seraphim comes down with a hot coal and touches his lips and says, You are made clean. You know, and so like that, I was just reading that today and I was just sharing it with uh, Andy earlier this afternoon when he got to church early to do coffee, which by the way, Andy, you've been doing that for a year. Thank you so much for your faithful Woo! service, for making us coffee all the time. Thank you, brother. And then that last song was a song that brought me to my knees today when I was listening to the worship songs on, uh, on uh, Pandora. And so it's so, it's just so neat how God does that. You know, he just meets you where you're at, and, uh, and I hope that you found as much encouragement and strength and uh, just those words of those songs that are so true um, concerning who God is, how big He is, and how uh, mighty He is and wonderful. We, uh, we do testimonies before we, we preach. We've been doing that since January, and today's going to be no different, and so we want to hear from you, I know there's one brother, Mike, who actually talked to me beforehand. He wants, he's going to kick us off. But just to share about what is God doing? What has God been doing? What is he doing in your life? What has he done uh, to just show himself to be God uh, in any way? And so God just, uh, wow, God is good. Even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. I'm going to read... I lied. I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 8 first. Uh, I just want you guys to just listen intently uh, what the Lord speaks through David concerning who we are as David recalls the creation account. And he uh, kind of calls our identity forward because that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is our identity in Christ and how that affects how we pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you even care for him? Yet, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also all beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Satan is a liar. I we have to understand this as, as true that everything the world says about who you are, even, even other people, what they've said about who you are, if it doesn't line up with the truth of God's word and what God's word says you are, it's from the devil and he is a liar. He's the father of lies. His native tongue is lying. If you're born in America, your native tongue is English. You can learn other languages, but you're going to always think and dream and everything's going to come out of your native tongue. Satan can come at you with a little bit of truth, but his native tongue, everything underneath it, is always going to have that accent, that lie at the base of it. It is who he is. He's a liar. God didn't create us to walk in weakness. We were created to walk as his image bearers. We were created to walk in his strength. His strength is perfected in our weakness but it's his strength that we're called to walk in. And I, and I want to I be clear on this thought so that it's not misconceived and so that people aren't <laughs> thinking I'm up here talking about how great we are and it's all about us and who we are in Christ and it, it just, it's, it's me, 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 and I'm, I'm great. This is not a prosperity message gospel. You're not going to get that from City Church. But he is our creator and we are his created. 
And there is a very distinct line. I want you to be, understand that this is what I believe. There's a very distinct and holy separation between God and us. That he is holy. That he is supreme. That he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And we are his created beings. And that at any point tonight, as I talk about who we are and the power of what God says and the glory that we share in him, as it just said in Psalm uh, 8, and as Jesus says in John 17, that all the glory, Father, you have given to me, I have given that to them. That we understand that this is only true in Christ Jesus. That anything we have is only true in Christ. Because if there's anything true in us, it was first true in him. It is only true because of him. And it is only maintained true despite our experiences because of him. All truth comes from Christ and nothing else. And so as we talk tonight about our identity, let there be no confusion, no misrepresentation uh, or manipulation of thought in your mind to think that you are something other than anything that Christ says you are. But the enemy is a liar. I and mean, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer the last two weeks, uh, our Father, right? Our Father who is in heaven, th this beautiful image of God as a loving Father. And, and the enemy comes in after that identity of who he is and who we are. If he's our Father, then we're his children. And he tries to attack that very image, that very truth of who we are in him. Of who he is towards us his feelings and his thoughts and his desires for us as his children, the enemy comes in and he attacks that. See, God has a plan for your life. He is your father who is in heaven. And he has desires for greatness in your life in Christ Jesus. But Satan has been coming against it since the beginning of our relationship with God. I just want to talk out of Genesis 1 through 3. It's not going to be on the screens. I just want to kind of give a lot of scripture. So I just want to kind of give an overview. As God creates heaven and earth, and on the sixth day, he creates man, right? And he tells man, he tells Adam, that you are to go out and subdue and have dominion over all of creation. And that word subdue means to, to make it be brought under your control for your profit. When you look at it in the, the Hebrew, that subdue is literally, it's almost like to make a slave for your benefit. You make something else be beneficial or fruitful for you. And your dominion is authority and power. So he's telling Adam, here's all my creation. Go out, subdue it, bring it under your authority that I've given you, and make it profitable in your power. And then God says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so he puts Adam to sleep. He makes Eve out of the rib, out of Adam's side, and, and they become one flesh. And so Adam and Eve are there, and there's this beautiful dynamic that God's already starting to establish. It's this family dynamic that is supposed to be on earth, a, a perfect representation or reflection of God's relationship with us. One is father with his children in complete control and authority, and also his posture towards us as a husband is towards his wife with nothing but love and her best interest. And so he gives this family the dominion and calls them to subdue it. And then he says something them, to them concerning how to do it. We're to create it in this world as, as children of God. We are to bring the earth under our submission because of the authority of God in our life to make it fruitful and profitable to us because the authority and power God has given us, not in our own strength, but God has given us. And then he tells us how to do it in Genesis 2. He tells Adam and Eve, he says, when you're in the garden, when you're in the garden, you got to work and keep it. Now, that might not make a lot of sense. When you look at the Hebrew, this idea of work is actually to serve. And keep is to protect. You see, God is telling us that what he created us for in the Genesis account is that he has created us to rule. He has given us authority and power to rule over his creation, to subdue it and make it fruitful under our reign. And our reign is to look like service and protection on his creation. That we are to serve and protect as we rule over. You can probably see it on the bottom of your, your inserts. There's or the top of your inserts, rather, there's scriptures that I'm not going to get into in John. If you want to see how this lives out, read John 13. Jesus taking his robes off and washing the disciples' feet. This is how the Son of Man, 
sets the example for all of us, what it looks like to be in power and authority over creation and yet serve and protect the created. And so God's speaking this identity and to his calling on Adam and Eve, but Satan's a liar. Satan's a liar. Satan comes to Eve and he says, did God really say? See, the first thing Satan always does is he challenges the word of God, the truth of God in our life. You see, the word of God and the truth of God is a spiritual truth. And it's something that we can't see in the natural. It's something that we can't uh, make real if we don't see it in the spiritual. It's kind of like telling a colorblind person, um, everything up here is gray. Um, (laughs) Right? You feel my pain. Colorblind person, you can tell them all day that this is brown. And they can believe it, but they can't experience it. You see, to experience the truths of God, it has to come by revelation. You can't see it in the natural mind. And so, so much of the truth of God, when he calls us sons and daughters of God on high, when he calls us the light of the world, it's stuff that we don't necessarily experience. Because if we're just looking in the natural, it's like being colorblind. And someone tells you it's brown, you go, okay, well, I believe you, but I can't see it. You've got to be able to have the gift of vision of color to be able to see the truth of what God's saying. And so Satan comes and he takes God's word. And he says, did God really say? His, his first attack on us is always about our identity is to challenge the word of God. Did God really say this is who you are? I mean, how many of us struggle with, you know, you, you sin big time, right? In your mind, it's that big sin that you've been struggling with. You're like, God, did, could God still love me? I mean, how much of God's word is dedicated to showing the surpassing grace and, and, and mercy and love of God if we repent? And yet, how often do we have that thought in our head when we mess up or when we're far from him? Could God still love me? That's Satan saying, did God really say that his forgiveness is never ending? Did God really say? And then he does something else. He actually gives us a new identity. He tells Eve, he, he gives her a part truth and a lie. He says, God doesn't want you to know that if you eat of the fruit, you can be like him. And this lie usually goes one of two ways. It's either you can be great without God, do it yourself, be independent, be successful, or it goes the other way, depending on your disposition and the circumstances of your life, is you got nothing. There's no hope for you. You're worthless. Either way, what he does is he comes after and he shows us something in the world. He shows us something experiential. There was the fruit there. She could see it and see that it was good to eat. She has this experience. She has this physical understanding of what Satan's putting before her. And and he calls on God's identity and her identity and he lies to her and she bites. We all bite. I bite all the time. All the time on who I am and who God is. In the, mi- in the midst of a moment. And so we see Adam and Eve. We see them. God comes to, to look for them. And it says that they hide. And they're in shame. And, it, and, and Adam, when God says, Adam, where are you? Adam goes, hey, we're hiding. <laughs> we figured out we're naked. They're ashamed. They're ashamed. And God says, who told you? Who told you you were naked? Who told you he doesn't heal anymore? Who's told you that you can't be free of your addiction? Who told you that your family is beyond repair? Who told you you don't have forgiveness? Who told you that depression is just part of who you are and it's a chemical makeup of your mind and there's no coming out of it? Who told you that your anger can never go away? That your porn and your lust is something you'll have to deal with the rest of your life? Who told you that you were so broken that you'll never be the same again? Who's telling you? Who are you listening to? Who tells you that God wants to firmly place you under his thumb and make you sit back and just watch him do everything? Because he's sovereign and he has no use for you, so you just sit and hope he makes a move on his own. Who told you that was his plan? Who told you you can't have joy? Who told you you can't have peace? Who told you you couldn't have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the life of resurrection now, today? Who told you that this isn't your reality? Who told you you weren't worthy of God's love? That you'd gone too far? 
guy is a liar. I believe Jesus, before on the Sermon on the Mount, we're, we're getting this Lord's Prayer out of, he starts off the sermon with, you are the light of the world. And he goes on to talk about the qualities of God, the qualities that he has for people. And he starts off this message, he starts off the prayer with, our Father who is in heaven, he's your daddy. Who told you he's anything other than a loving father? Who told you he's anything other than a good, good God? Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You were created. We were all created to bring the fruitful production of heaven to earth by the authority and power in God's very spirit through serving and protecting in love. That's who you were created to be. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God created us to bring forth his kingdom to earth. He wouldn't have told us to pray about it if it wasn't so. Who you are is so important. Anything less than God's plan for spreading the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and releasing the Holy Spirit into a broken world is a lie from the enemy. If you think your role in this creation, this creation experiment, if you will, of God, this, this God saving the world has nothing to do with you, that he's got it all under control, you're wrong. You can't do it without him, but he won't do it without you. You can't, he won't. He calls us to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, he's rich, he's powerful, he can't be stopped. Holy is your name. You're the only one with power. You're the only one who is separate from all of us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on, he- on earth as it is in heaven. He is calling us forward into an identity of who we are and that we should pray our minds should be set accordingly. Paul in Ephesians, there's a lot of scripture. Buckle in. It's another one of the verses that's in your outline, in your insert, that I encourage you to read this week. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption, for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Continuing on, He says, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And again, I do not cease to give thanks for you, Paul says, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened or open, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in you, his saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards you who believe, towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also the ages to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. All his power and his authority given to the church in Christ Jesus, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. But God being rich in mercy, jumping to chapter two, because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For this reason I bow before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all of the saints What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. 
that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And then in chapter 6, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If God says it, it's true. No matter what. No matter how I feel today versus how I feel tomorrow. No matter how I feel if I feel like I'm failing or if I feel like I'm succeeding, God's word is always true. What God says about me is more true than even my own experiences. It's interesting that I can, I can read this and I can get pumped up, you know. I can get excited about it, but the truth is, is, is I walk around with no authority on a regular basis not understanding who I am in the Lord, not understanding who God created me, the purpose he's created for me, and, and I walk around without authority. It's like, it's like a cop being given the badge, and the badge isn't really the authority. It's the authority of the government and the laws that, that give him that position, right? It's like having a cop come up to arrest somebody and look at the guy, he's, the perp he's about to arrest, and he's 250 pounds of muscle, and the cop's, you know, my size, and going like, well, I might be a cop, but you're big. I have no authority to arrest you. You see, the, the cop stands boldly before the criminal, regardless of size, regardless of if the criminal's smarter than the cop or not, the IQ doesn't matter. None of those things that he experiences, feels, or sees matter. The authority he has is in the laws and the decree of the state to deem him a cop, to give him the right to serve and protect. But so often it's easy, we can get caught up I can get caught up looking at my circumstances and looking at myself and forget who I am. Watchman Nee gave a great analogy of this. He said, there's three men. One was truth, one was faith, and one was experience. And they're walking along a very narrow wall. Truth walks straight, never looks to the left or the right, and he leads the way. Faith stays on the wall as long as he's looking at truth. But the second faith turns around to see where experience is. They both fall. how I feel, what I've experienced, what I see of myself. My history may be a fact, but it is not the greatest fact. The greatest fact is what God says about me because who I am is found in Christ Jesus. And if I truly believe who Jesus is, then that is my greatest identity. That is my authority. That is my power over all things. My father says I'm his child because of his son, our big brother Jesus. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The spirit of fear, or to look at the circumstances and the facts and realities that we experience in the flesh, who we are every day. To, to me, I think the greatest example I could see is elephants are these huge, majestic creatures, beyond powerful. You, you might see, like on, in India, uh, they'll have tug of wars, but they'll have like 50 men, maybe even more, against one elephant. The elephants just drag and 50 men across the field, right? And it's just funny. It's like these guys are digging in, and they don't have a chance against this elephant. That very same elephant will be held captive in the middle of a field by a single foot-long stake and a small string that could be snapped by probably many of us here today. How does that happen? You see, when the elephant is young and is a baby, they take a rope, they tie it to its leg, and they tie the elephant to a tree. And the elephant kicks, and it struggles, and it doesn't have the strength to get away from a tree. And when it stops fighting, 
and he gets to the point where it feels the tug of the rope, it just settles back into its back foot and it stays in its spot. And so then what they do is the elephant gets larger, they have to move it to a larger space, is they'll take a stake in the ground, they'll drive a small little stake in the ground and they'll tie a small string to the elephant's leg. And even though the elephant is full grown, it will feel the slight tension of the rope. It'll stop and it won't break free. The lie of the enemy is nothing more than a soft stake and soft ground with a small string attached to your body. He has no power and no authority over who you are unless you give it to him. You see, every great man or woman of faith operated in a twofold way. They knew exactly who God was and how big and capable he was, that he was father and that he was holy. And they also knew what he said about them. Before Abraham had the faith to put Isaac on an altar, he believed the word of God about him that he would be a great nation. And so he was willing to put his only son on an altar, not because the reality of his son dying was going to stop it, but because he understood what God said about him. Abram, my son, my friend, you will be a great nation. Moses before the Red Sea ever happened, was told by God that I'm going to use you to save my people and you will be as God unto them. And so when Moses gets to the Red Sea and he starts getting scared again, which Moses did a lot early on, do what God tells Moses. He doesn't go, hold still, I'm going to perform a magic trick and get the sea to part. He goes, Moses, take your staff, raise your arm, and you part the sea. Oh, Moses obeys and God moves. Joshua then was commissioned by God through Moses, and he, and he told Joshua, no man will stand before you, only be strong and courageous. And so when Joshua gets in the battle, and the day is drawing near to an end, and victory is no way going to be had, he doesn't ask God for the sun to stand still. He commands the sun to stand still because he understood what God's promise meant and who he was in the kingdom of God. Sun stands still. He doesn't have to ask God to do something for him because he knows who he is in his father's house. Gideon, hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat, the weakest man in his family of the weakest tribe of Israel in an oppressed land is hiding, trying to pick kernels of wheat from the shaft. And God sends an angel and says, mighty man of valor. Man, Gideon was about as sad as they come. But that didn't stop God from calling him who he had made him to be. And Gideon with 300 men would take out an entire army of Midianites. David, likely an illegitimate son of Jesse, out there with the sheep, Samuel comes in to anoint a king of Israel. He says, Jesse, bring all your sons. And Jesse brings everyone but David. And David's out there doing kind of servant's work with the, the livestock. Disgraced by his own family, potentially. David said, my mother bore me in iniquity. My father and mother have abandoned me. There's a good chance Jesse wasn't proud of David at all. But God says, this is the man, because I don't look at the outward appearance, but this is the man, the king, my next king. David knew who he was when he showed up at the battle line. Even his big brother calling him conceited didn't deter him from facing Goliath. And when Saul wanted to give him his armor, David goes, no, God has called me. God has called me and my God is mighty. And I will do what he has trained me to do, who he's made me to be. And I will take these three smooth stones in this sling and I will slay that giant. He knew who he was because of what God said about him, not because of his experience of being displaced and put down even in his own family. And he stood strong on the word of God concerning his life. Mary, before she ever commanded Jesus basically to make water into wine, knew that she was favored amongst women, that she would bear the son of man, the king of glory. And so before Jesus' time, to, to even go about his ministry, she goes, just do whatever he says. That woman knew who she was. She knew she had the favor of God to call on the Son of God to do whatever she needed him to do. And she calls Jesus forward out of who she knew she was and who she knew her son was to do something even before the time it was appointed. Knowing who you are is critical. 
John and Peter, <laughs> in Acts, before they tell a cripple to get up and walk, they've been told by Christ who they were, that they were apostles. And when they realize who Jesus was, because your identity is always first found in Jesus, it has to be true in Jesus before it can ever be true in you. And you have to understand that about your king. Peter says, you are the son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says, you are no longer called Simon, but you are now Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I am giving you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He gave extreme authority to the apostles. And so when Peter and John are walking into the gate of Solomon and the beggar is asking for change and Peter looks at him and says, like, hey, money I don't have for you, but what I have I give. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Peter knew exactly who he was. And it changed everything. Seven sons of Sceva are beat senseless and nude by demons because they were going around in false authority and they said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but we do not know you. And they beat these boys senseless right out of their clothes. There's authority in who you are and who God created you to be. It is so imperative that we understand what Jesus says about who we are because it changes the way we think, it changes the way we speak, and it changes the way we live. Paul said, I, I, I wish that I would not be made less, but that more of Christ would clothe me, as he wrote the Corinthian church. There was a lie in the enemy that takes us in a place where we think we have no authority on this earth, that it's all, it's all just God and nothing else, but it was God's good pleasure to give us the keys to the kingdom, to pray and to speak and to act and to live, to bring heaven onto earth. His will that is done perfectly there, here, now. Do you know who you are? Do we actually walk in who we are? Do we believe that, Father, I am who you say I am? Some of the names we've been called in scriptures that God or Jesus has called us directly, the light of the world, his delight, friends, children of God, sons and daughters of Lord on high, chosen ones, holy nation, royal priesthood, prized possession, his heir, his heir, his beloved, his redeemed, blessed, holy, blameless, pure, more than conquerors, accepted, new creation, new creature, free, citizen, and co-laborers with Christ. If this is who I am, then how I speak my authority, how I interact with my heavenly Father, it changes. I don't have to beg. Not because I'm something special, but because Jesus has made me the prize of God's very eye, the apple of his eye. And in Christ, I can do all things that he equips me for. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are guarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God wants to speak your identity into your life. He wants to speak the purpose he created you for into your life. He looked at Jesus and said, this is my son who I am well pleased. And the same glory that he gave Jesus, he gives to us. John 17, 22. If 
you know who you are, there's no need to fear. If you know who you are, you can pray boldly and come before the throne boldly at the feet of Jesus and ask anything. Seek him for anything. Inquire about anything. But it's all first found in him. You see, whatever is true in us is always first true in Jesus. And whatever is true in us is hidden within Christ himself. And this is where the intimacy, this entire conversation, this prayer series comes back to this idea of intimacy in prayer. It's to truly understand who you are. is isn't just to name it and claim it. Well, I want to be this, so I'm going to name it. And if I'm in Christ, therefore it is. No, it's to find intimacy in the Father and then let the Father speak to you. You see, if he's our Father who is in heaven, he wants to speak to us as any father loves to speak to their children, speak life and truth into their children. And we talked about giving God praise last week and the need to come before the Lord. And, and this is the access point. Because if, it's, if our identity is locked up in Christ, then we first have to know and speak and, and believe and walk out the truth of who Jesus is for us to understand the truth of who we truly are. Does that make sense? And so as we pray to God, we, we shower our praises and our affections on God and we call God by who He rightfully is. He is holy and blameless, that He is true and just, that He is merciful and forgiving, that He is all-powerful. When we call these things out and we start to speak, but do we ever stop to listen about what He says about us? How many of you as a father, if you came home and your children came running up to you and they praised you and hugged you and kissed you and said, Daddy, I love you, or Mommy, I love you, and they just and they were loving on you like, oh my gosh, and the second you went to tell them how you felt about them, they ran off and left you. Would you feel your love complete without being able to share it back? It would be disheartening if that was your experience with your children, that your children never actually got to hear you say how you feel about them. So often I can get so caught up in praising God, and trust me, there is nothing greater than to give God the glory that He deserves because He is holy and set on high. But to stop and let the Holy Spirit speak the truth of what God has to say about me changes my life forever. I'll share a quick testimony before we pray. A couple years ago, I was going through a real tough time. And uh, I was running uh, by the river. And I remember asking God, I was like, who am I, Lord? What's going on? Like, ministry's going nowhere. I don't know who I am. And I'm running and I'm praying. I'm listening to music. And I felt like God said, I have, I have called you to be a warrior for my people. And I remember it just touched my heart and I broke down crying. And so that's like three years. And then fast forward, uh, um, another year from there, and I'm, I'm doing this, this leadership team with some, some young people at our church, and, and we're going through just who we are in Christ, and we're studying the Word of God together, and there was a part in this booklet um, that we were going through by Banning Liebesher, and and he asked for us to take some time to pray and let God speak to who we are. Let God give you the identity of what He created you for. He's, he's given us gifts He's given us purpose, each of us individually and corporately as a people. Let God speak to you who, you, who he says you are. And God gives me something. He says, I, I have called you to be a general in my army. And I'm thinking, this has to be my ego because I already know it's big. For you to call me a general, this has to be me. And I was nervous. I was like, here I'm supposed to be leading these people. I didn't want to come out and be like, Every, you know, what has God called you? Well, he called me a general, so, <laughs> you know? You know what I mean? I was nervous, and I went to go preach at Access Church, and I can remember it to this day like it was yesterday, and I was preaching on Ephesians 2.10, walking in the things of the Lord, uh, just going and walking in the truth of God, and this guy I've never met before comes up to me after service, and, and I was going to be meeting with everyone the very following day to go through what we'd been studying, and God had just given me this, you're a general, and this guy comes up to me, he has a piece of paper, and he folds it, and he goes, this is what the Lord told me about you, do not open it till tomorrow. And I go, okay. And so we get the next morning, everyone's over at my house and we're doing this, this study and we're calling and we're talking about who we are in the Lord. And I said, so here's the thing is, I, I felt like God called me a general and this guy gave me this piece of paper and I opened the paper and I read it and he says, the Lord says you were a general in his army.
a warrior, a general. Fast forward now a couple years, we're at the healing rooms doing a well event, and one of the speakers I invited in came over and said, the Lord showed me that he uses you like a hatchet, that you're a battle axe at war, chopping down against the lies of the enemy to reveal the truth of God. Don't stop swinging. Don't stop swinging. The Lord confirmed over and over again who I was. God has so much for you in Christ. I didn't find these things out because I just needed to know who I was. I found these things as I pursued Christ. It comes out of the intimacy of loving Jesus, of putting Jesus first, and Jesus alone is God and King. And in the quietness of doing that, when your heart, like we talked about last week, when you get to a place where you've praised God and you've, you've given all the glory to God in such a way that you are completely and thoroughly impressed by Him, in the quietness of your spirit, the Lord can speak back who He's created you to be. I was praying about this as I was doing this message. I was walking around my house and I was praying in tongues and I was praying in the spirit and I was just, I was just giving God praise. I was just lifting up the name of Jesus. Every, every accolade, every name I could think of that is, that is representative of who Jesus is and I'm praying, I'm praying around the block and, I'm, and I swing into the grocery store to get something for my wife and, and I get my stuff and I get up to the front counter and I'm just like, I'm like you know when like you've been touched by God and you're just feeling the spirit rest on you and I'm praying just for more, Jesus, I need more of you. You need to be glorified in my life and I get up and there's a Native American man who's about from me to the stool in this line and he's getting ready to pay and I step up and I'm about this far, I'm not in his space and I'm standing there and he gets his money back and all of a sudden, and I'm looking at the magazines there, and all of a sudden I hear, do you want to talk some sh- shinola? You know? And, and I look, and I look at him, and this guy, his lip is quivering, and his hands are shaking, and he's shaking from head to toe. And I go, oh, excuse me? He goes, do you want to talk some sh... And I'm like, and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, he's coming after who you are in the flesh. I was an ex-professional fighter. I love fighting. Like, this is Christmas for me. You know what I mean? Like, like happy birthday and Christmas at once. He, and the words is what made it so true. Is He wasn't, did you say something? Because I obviously hadn't said nothing. He's like, do you want to? It was an invitation for my flesh to step forward. I felt like the Holy Spirit say, this, this is demonic. And I looked at him and I smiled in all peace. No adrenaline. You get before fight. If you've ever been in a fight, especially guys, you know, your heart races, your mouth gets dry, you start shaking a little bit. Even if you fight a lot, like you get a little, you get a little revved. You know, like you're ready to go if you know it's about to go down. Calm, cool as a cucumber, not because I'm a cool customer, but because the Holy Spirit came over and said, no, this is, this is the enemy. And so I looked at him. I said, man, no, I don't want to fight you. And he grumbled some things and, yeah, you. And then he walked out and he stopped. He grabbed his stuff and he started walking. He turned around and he yelled, yeah, you again. And the, and the clerk looks at me and she goes, I'm so sorry. I don't know what that was about. And I didn't want to get into it. I was still trying to process what I just experienced. I go, I don't either. And she goes, do you know what's crazy? Is he comes in here like two, three times a week. He's been coming here for years. He's never opened his mouth once. The man had been there for years, weekly, never opened his mouth once. And I looked at her, and she hands me my groceries, my receipt, and I go, I can't pass this up. This is, this is a moment to share about the presence of the Lord. And I said, you know what? I do know what just happened. And I just shared with her exactly. I've been walking around these streets praying for more of the presence of God, more of the Holy Spirit to rest on my life, that when I come in places, the atmosphere changes, not because I say or do anything, but because my eyes are so fixed on the goodness and glory of God that who I am in Him radiates out. I, I've been walking, and she goes, yep. And I go, that, and that, and that evil in him recognizes, recognize Christ in me. And she's like, yeah. And I go, and I just looked, I don't know, I don't even know this cashier's name. I've seen her numerous times. I was like, look, it, it's our job to seek the presence of Jesus because in that, that's where life is. And that's where things change is in the presence of God and knowing who we are in him, and that we can carry the Holy Spirit just as he did, because the glory he was given was given to us. And I said, you have a nice day. And she goes, you too. And I walked home, and I prayed for that guy with peace in my heart, love for him. I hope to run into him soon at the grocery store, because if he's there multiple times a week, so am I. It's bound to happen. God wants to tell you who you are and how he's made you. 
Because as we find out who we are in Christ together as a family, we become the fullness of Christ on earth together. Not individually. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, He calls us His children for His purpose. And so we're going to spend about five minutes praying. I just, I want to encourage you guys as we we step into prayer to really, really give Jesus your full attention in your heart. And then when when you are impressed by the glory of the King on high, silence yourself and allow God to start to speak into who you are. God so wants to reveal his creative purpose, his power and authority that he has set aside for you to walk in, to build up the church, and to bring kingdom of heaven onto earth for his glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are so worthy of our praise. Oh, you are good. So here's here's the challenge of just something that touched me this week. Psalm 8, what I read at the beginning. Uh, and then I mentioned John 13 through 17. These, are, it's, these scriptures should be in your insert. And then Ephesians 1 through 4. Um, my recommendation is that every day you, you start with just one. I, I just uh, read Psalm 8 tomorrow. Read John 13 through 17. It, the beauty of John 13 through 17 is it's all one moment with Christ. He starts off by serving and then he teaches before they get up to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Those five chapters are one conversation where Jesus is imparting his final wisdom before he is to be betrayed and crucified. And there's so much to be seen about who we are and how God wants to work in us in those five chapters. And so reading them as one section, one story is so powerful to see Jesus in that. And then again, to read Ephesians 1 through 4, because that's where Paul talks about who we are in Christ before he starts talking about now that we know who we are, how we walk comes out of that. And so you would start Monday, Psalm 8, real short. Then you do John on Tuesday, Ephesians on Wednesday, and repeat again all the way through Saturday, and then Psalm 8 again on next Sunday. And I just challenge you to to read those things, to give God praise, and and to ask the Holy Spirit to make those truths true in you, and then just spend five minutes in quiet. And let the Holy Spirit start to speak about what He says to you and what he, whatever He wants to talk about. God has so much He wants to give us. And sometimes it's just as simple as telling Him how much we love Him and then just stopping and letting Him shower us with His love in the midst of our quiet time. I don't know who is praying tonight. Do we know? Jason and Andrew will be over here. If you have specific prayers, Jason and Andrew would love to pray with you guys. Uh, Again, help pick up chairs as you you leave. No hurry. Uh, We love you. Be blessed, and we'll see you next Sunday.